Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program featuring reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Our show is sponsored by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview Bishop Abraham Allende. We will also hear more about the life of St. Augustine and the readings for this 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time. That and more on Wineskins. In our current issue segment, I will speak with Father Ed Noga, Pastor Emeritus of St. Patrick Church in Youngstown. With me again is Father Ed Noga, who's Pastor Emeritus of St. Patrick Church in Youngstown. Welcome back to Wineskins. Good to be here. You know, in our short time together, Father Ed, we'd like to talk about your retirement. Tell us, what does a retired priest do all day? Came across and somebody sent to me when I first retired something that Pope Francis said about ministers in the church retiring. And I, this was specifically for priests, but his comments also went on for all those who minister in the church. But he said, as priests, we go to school a lot. We've studied a lot. And he says, and there's always things that we want to keep up on because we should professionally and pastorally. But he goes, sometimes you just don't have the time. So he said, I would hope that in retirement, this is Pope Francis speaking, the church ministers would spend more time reading and also doing the basic pastoral duties in churches that need to be taken care of. You know, people would say, well, you mean like hearing confessions or preparing people for baptisms or uh, having weekend liturgies. But when you stop to think of it, sometimes those basic, very basic pastoral and sacramental realities that we have in the church, they're not neglected, but they're because of the lack of priests in our country, uh, they're not taken care of as maybe as good as they should. Nobody's fault. It's just that there's there's fewer of us. So I look at his couple of quotes every morning. I have probably worked as much on the weekends as I did when I was pastor, and, I, and by, by choice, because when four of us retired, Two fellows moved out of town because of family. Well, that's fine. And one person has some real chronic health issues, and he said, I have to take care of my health. So I said, oh, I'll go on the volunteer list, and I, I'm amazed how many calls you get. So I, I enjoy it. I certainly enjoyed I loved being pastor and, and working with so many dedicated people at St. Pat's for over 30 years. But visiting other churches and seeing the amount of volunteerism and lay pastoral leaders in parishes is extremely, extremely encouraging. And I might add that, especially during this pandemic, people just stepping forward on many different realms of the church, whether it's disinfecting pews or making sure the St. Vincent de Paul food pantry still operate, has been uh, absolutely mind-boggling but extremely helpful. So I, being in touch with parishes on the weekend and still doing a little bit of counseling and that and catching up on reading, I found that after missing doing that for so many years, when you start doing it, you kind of feel guilty, like, geez, I'm taking all this time reading a, a book. But we need to do those things. They enliven us so we can help enliven others. You know, you, you were talking about volunteers, and, and our parishes really could not exist without people who give their time and their talents to really benefit the church. And I think that's the same for us as priests. You know, when we kind of let down that that administrative responsibility and get to kind of the grassroot things of, of why we were ordained and, oh, yes. and who we are all about Absolutely. as ordained ministers, then we, we understand how crucial and fundamental what we do is all about. What is you kind of look ahead as we've kind of still weather this pandemic, but also doing things in a different way, where do you see the church in our local diocese going? Building on what you just said also, I, I would hope that we would continue. I know a lot of things have been kind of put on hold for a while, but I hope that we would continue to train good lay leaders to offer the continuing education that all of us need to be constantly updated on uh, encyclicals. You know, the Holy Father has written some tremendous, tremendous letters to the World Church, and they're nice to read, but they need to be applied locally. So what might work here in Youngstown, Ohio, or in America may not work 
as well in the continent of Africa or in Europe. So we need to tailor those things. That takes work. That takes effort. And without a team effort, I think the more we collaborate, uh, the better off we're going to be, including parishes collaborating in the sense of, I notice there's a movement now to kind of stagger some of our weekend mass schedules. That's absolutely crucial as we have a society that you know, work hours are no longer nine to five, and we need to be able to be there when people need us to be there. So I think the more that pastors, listen to me uh, being pastor emeritus, but I think the more that pastors know their fellow pastors in their locales and say, what are things we can do together that benefit everybody in the region will be a key factor. And not just because there's fewer priests, but because we do have dedicated volunteers and pastoral ministers who know the gospel, love the gospel, and want to share it. Father Anoga, thank you so much for your presence on Wineskins and for your many years of service to the local church in the Diocese of Youngstown. Thank you. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. The Feast of St. Augustine is celebrated on Saturday. To tell us more about this bishop and doctor of the church is Tom McCarthy. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman. This feast appears in the sacramentary as early as the 8th century, but it is not celebrated in Rome until after the 11th century. Born in modern Algeria on November the 13th, 354, he studied the pagan classics but rejected the scriptures, considering them too demanding and uncultured. In 371, he moved to Carthage, where he accepted the teaching of the double principle, one of good and another of evil. In spite of the concessions to indulgence of the flesh permitted by that doctrine, Augustine finally became a skeptic. Still, unsatisfied, he traveled to Rome where he became deathly ill, but did not ask to be baptized. By the year 384, he was a teacher of rhetoric in Milan and was reunited with his mother, Monica. Hearing St. Ambrose give an explanation of the sacred scripture, Augustine was captivated. At the age of 32, while shedding tears of anguish, he seemed to hear a child sing, take and read. He opened the Bible at random and read the words of St. Paul. Let us live honorably as in daylight, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual excess and lust, not in quarreling and jealousy. Rather, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the desires of the flesh. After telling his mother what had happened, he made the necessary preparations and was baptized by St. Ambrose. After the death of his mother, Augustine returned to Africa in 388 together with two close friends. He had already, at Monica's insistence, sent away his concubine, the mother of his son. Some three years later, Augustine was ordained a priest in Hippo and in 395 ordained a bishop. For 35 years, he preached in his cathedral, administered the affairs of the church, answered letters that came to him from all parts, and defended the faith against heretics. As bishop, he lived a community life with some of his clergy and found time to write some of his major works, including a catechism for catechumens. He died at the age of 76 on August 28, 430. St. Bede states that Augustine's body was transferred to Sardinia to protect it from the vandals. From there, it was moved to Pavia, where it is venerated today. The new prayers of Mass touch on the characteristics of this outstanding theologian who is rightly called Doctor of Grace. In the opening prayer, we ask that God will renew his church with the spirit he gave to St. Augustine, so that, filled with the same spirit, we may seek you as the source of eternal love. The search for truth and love was indeed the motivating force in Augustine's life. He had written, What does the soul desire more ardently than truth? It is known by love. He realized the true wisdom is not found in the philosophy that he had studied in his youth, but only when one transcends the level of the intellect and reaches the heart. Thus he described this wisdom as something beyond the eye of the soul, beyond my spirit, your immutable light. St. Augustine understood very well that the focal point for unity in the Church is the Eucharist. Therefore, in the prayer after communion, 
we ask that we may be made holy by the sharing at the table of the Christ and the members of his body, may become what we have received. Augustine is thus the teacher of liturgical spirituality based on the Eucharist. He developed this theme especially in his preaching at Easter, saying, Sing in March, God is at the end of the march. For Wineskins, I'm Tom McCarthy. I'm talking with Bishop Abraham Allende from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And you know, Bishop Allende, for several years, we've celebrated, or many years, actually 20 years, we've celebrated communion with Catholics and Lutherans here in our local polity. Can you talk about your experience of that and what was significant for you and what you'd like to lift up to share with the folks that are with us? Well, thank you very much for that opportunity because every two years we have celebrated the Lutheran Catholic Covenant that we signed after the Doctrine of Justification was signed. The Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification was signed back in 1999. Bishop Tobin and Bishop Miller at the time signed the Lutheran Catholic Covenant so that we would pray and study together and also engage in social acts together. So that's been a, a big hallmark of our relationship. And I've had the privilege of celebrating that worship service every two years. We do a, a Vespers and, and it's in different locations. I can recall I, it was at Kent uh, my very first year, then in Canton at Zion Lutheran Church. And then we were over here at St. Michael's in Canfield. And then, of course, the 500th anniversary in 2017, we celebrated at St. Columba right. Cathedral. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's been one of my greatest joys, because every time I look out at the assembled, I think this is what the kingdom of God is mm -hmm. supposed to look like, mm -hmm. you know. No distinction for who is Roman Catholic and who is Lutheran. And the other memory that I have that I really carry with me now is, is that of, of celebrating with Bishop Murray, the late mm -hmm. Bishop Murray, mm -hmm. because he and I had an interesting friendship. I knew him from my days as a parish pastor in Canton when I was the Lutheran observer to the Catholic Commission of Stark County and he would come to those meetings and of course I got to interact with him then. And then of course when I became bishop we had the chance to do the celebrations mm -hmm. together. I just found him to be a humble person but a jovial person and the things that I miss when I think about it I think about just the joy of being in his presence. He had this hearty laugh. So there isn't a day goes by that, that he doesn't come into my mind in one way or the other because of that relationship that we had and I really uh, was saddened when God called him but you know he's one of the fondest memories that I will have of, sure. of this relationship mm -hmm. that we share. For us as Catholics in the Diocese of Youngstown we've been very blessed to have bishops who have guided us and led us in a very profound way but also understand the need for an ecumenical attitude and interfaith dialogue Without that, I think the church would be poorer. I think the church is very enlivened and enriched with our spirit of ecumenism. And if we didn't have that, what would we do and where would we be? And this is the, the reason that Christ left us the church, is to be the transformational element in the world. The church is the, the kingdom of God on earth. And so what we do in, in our worship services is we are basically rehearsing, and the way I look at it is we're rehearsing for the kingdom. And so we are to witness to, to that love that God has for all creation. So if we didn't have the church, we wouldn't have a witness. I love that image of uh, it's almost like a dress rehearsal that we're in preparation for the actual event. So that's, it's a nice image. Let's talk about some of those things that have happened in our parishes, Lutheran and Catholic parishes, where groups of faithful have gotten together to really celebrate the covenant, but talk about issues and things that affect both of them. How has that been and how would you encourage those that have engaged in that to continue that? I think that it's one way of giving 
people educating them as to you know those issues that as I said earlier are no longer church dividing but those issues that still remain mm -hmm. and and these dialogues have been uh, approached in earnest by both the Lutherans and the Catholics and I, and I think the goal is we want to get beyond that because I think this is what the people want the people want to be able to celebrate together you know one of the things that I remember about those teaching sessions that we have before we do the evening worship is that the biggest question that comes out, no matter what's discussed, is when are we going to be able to celebrate the sacrament sure. together? Mm -hmm. And I think people have a thirst for that. They, they want to be together in more ways, especially that would be the ultimate when we would be able to celebrate by taking communion as one instead of in our separate places. As a retired bishop of the Northeast Ohio Synod, what do you do in your retirement and what do you hope to accomplish as you continue to be a minister? in God's church. I will continue to witness. I will continue to make disciples if the opportunity presents itself because I love God. I love the church. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I want to see is, is a world where we can put aside divisions, where we can put aside the, the tension and the anxiety that exists. There are issues of social justice, poverty, homelessness, hunger, racial divisions that I want to speak out for. And, and of course, one, one issue that's very, very close to me is immigration reform, right. because uh, my first parish was a mission congregation that reached out to the Latino community of, of the Canton area. I want to see everyone be welcomed by society. We welcome them in the church, but in society it's a little different matter. And this is, goes back to what I said earlier about the church's role in, in transforming the minds and, and renewing the people's minds as to look at, at a person, regardless of the color of their skin or the accent with which they speak, to look at them as a child of God, because mm -hmm. that's what we all are. Sure. Bishop Allende, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on our show. We wish you well in your retirement. We know that you'll continue to be active and spread the word of God and be a witness to this kingdom that we celebrate together. Well, these have been very enjoyable. I'm going to miss this. <laughs> thank we'll you. We'll have you back again. All right. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. To receive more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. By the time we can walk, each of us yearns for the joy that comes from being able to do for ourselves. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Church World Service. Our song today is by Karen Herman. It is from her CD entitled, Though Our Earth Be Shaken, Show Your Power.
Our scripture reflections for this 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time will be by Father John Sheridan. He is pastor of St. Peter Church and the rector of the Basilica of St. John the Baptist, both in Canton. Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. After these weeks of listening to the Bread of Life discourses, this Sunday we hear about the reaction of the people and the response of the apostles. For weeks we have listened to our blessed Lord tell us that he is the bread of life. Up to now we have reflected on what it means to believe in Jesus and why there is such a lack of faith in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Today we are faced with a choice. Do we, like those unbelieving disciples in the gospel, leave him? Do we walk away no longer to practice the faith? This has obviously been the answer of many who used to sit among us in the pews at our churches. Or do we, like Peter and the other faithful apostles, remain by his side, convinced that he is the Holy One of God? Believing in Christ is not always easy, but he did not tell us that it would be, for he says, Pick up your cross and follow me. St. Peter, whose faith seems so strong in today's gospel, is the perfect example of someone who struggles with faith in Christ. Very much a weak and fragile person, Peter shows us the way to belief in Christ. Our blessed Lord recognizes in Peter something that we would probably not see on our own. Though he was certainly aware of his faults, Jesus trusts Peter so much that he placed in him charge of the church he founded. When we first encounter Peter, it is after a long day of work fishing on the sea. He does not want to do as the Lord instructs him, but in the end he listens and casts his net for a great catch of fish. He responds, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Later he sees the Lord walking on the waters, and to prove that it is the Lord, he requests that he might come out on the water to meet the Lord. But when he takes his eyes off the Lord, he begins to drown, crying out, Lord, save me. And our Lord responded, Why did you doubt? In today's gospel, he professes faith in the Lord, but later he will not wish to acknowledge what that means, that Jesus will have to endure suffering and death on the cross. To which the Lord says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. And in the days leading up to his passion, Peter says that he will go to the death for Jesus. But when the time comes, he denies that he even knows Christ, and chooses not to suffer with him. Peter was not called because he was perfect. He was called in spite of his weaknesses and his failings to give himself completely to Christ. Like an earthen vessel, he was fragile and empty, but strengthened by Christ, he was filled up with the grace of the Holy Spirit. We too are earthen vessels in the hands of the heavenly potter, who has molded us into what we are today. He gives us the strength to carry on, He fills us with all we need to do his will. He calls each one of us by name, and as a shepherd he cares for his sheep. God loves us beyond all telling. The Lord has the power and the desire to undo our sins and failings and to strengthen us in our weaknesses if we would let him. If we truly believe, as Peter proclaims and as we profess each Sunday, that Jesus is the Son of God and that he has given us his own body and blood to nourish us on our journey, we will never want to be parted from him. And so if you are struggling with your own faith, ask for the intercession of St. Peter and follow his example, for he knows well our struggles. He is a man who sinned, but who turned to the Lord for forgiveness and received a great place in heaven. Pray also to the Holy Spirit that he may fill you with strength so that you can boldly proclaim with St. Peter, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. For Wineskins, I'm Father John Sheridan. If you are missing friends, how can you find some? If you are awash in friends, how can you reach out to someone who is new and lonely? How can we strengthen the faith that we have in the context of how we live? Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a blessed Sunday and a safe week.
What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. <laughs> what have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. 